things. Therefore, uh, I want to welcome uh, you on behalf of the student uh, community. And I would wish at this juncture also to just call the student chair, only the student chair to come and just say a word uh, after me before we invite to speak. So Langat should be around somewhere. And then I also want to welcome the administration of this region represented by the county commissioner uh, for Homer Bay County, uh, when I learn. He's come here to make sure that government is here. And as you all know, Homer Bay is a very peaceful uh, county, a county where a lot of activities are going on because of the peace and tranquility that he has given to this county with his team. And therefore, uh, Bwana Lelan, feel welcome with your team. And then also to other guests who have actually come with the Honorable uh, Chief Guest, I also want you to feel at home and actually be Tomboya. And when you come, I believe the spirit of Tomboya would have uh, permeated uh, into your life. Thank you. So I want to give Langat just to say a word, then we invite the Chief Guest to talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, our chief guest of today, Honorable Dini Nyoro, our county commissioner, all the distinguished guests, my friends from Maseno University, my colleagues from Tomboy University, and all other members present. Good morning. Allow me to take this opportunity to thank God and also to thank you for coming. This is a very good privilege and also honor to have this opportunity and this event here at Tomboy University. I'm Langat Emmanuel Kibiagon, the chairperson of Tomboy University Student Organization, and we are very, very happy today to witness and also to participate in this public lecture in tracing the footstep of our father, Thomas Joseph Mboya, and also on mentoring of the leaders. We are leaders of tomorrow. We are very happy because our father, who is Tom Boyer was a leader. So we need also Tom Boyer University to be the source and home for leadership. Thank you and feel most welcome. Finally, Chief Guest, uh, I don't want to sit down before I acknowledge uh, our father mentor. You know, you know, sometimes you, you, you don't forget your home even if you have been pushed out by Father Cultural to go and make yours. So I want to specifically uh, welcome uh, Professor Julius Nebudi, the Vice Chancellor of Maseno University, who is the mentor of Tom Boya University. In fact, in this country, Maseno has mentored two universities, Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga in Siaya and Tom Boya University. And we are all grandchildren of Moe University. <laughs> and therefore, you can see that Moe University's tree is growing because we also hope one day we are also going to mentor a child who is going to be the great grandchild of Maseno University and the great grandchild of Moe University. Thank you very much, Professor Nebundi, for coming as the VC of Maseno and as the representative of the council. Therefore, it's now my single duty to welcome the chief guest, Honorable Dini Nyoro, to do his public address. So we can stand and welcome him with a clap and music. Thank you. You can have a seat.
Thank you very much. Our Vice Chancellor and my friend, Professor Ochola, the father of this university, Professor Nyabundo, our County Commissioner, Bwana Moses Lilian, our President or Student Leader here in Tomboya University, Bwana Emmanuel Lagat, all the staff of Tomboya University, the family who are present here of Tom Joseph Boya, all the other guests and comrades. Good morning. Comrades to Simame Tabadali. Comrades power. Power. Even powerless. Hakuna power, powerless. Kama ni power, ni power. Comrades power. Power. Wani squeeze ya mwani hivi? Tap the person in front of you at a gum kick dog. It seems some are fighting. No, tapping, not fighting. Comrades power. Power. Asante ni sana, we can have our seats. Um, I want to take this opportunity, first of all, to appreciate the management of Tom Boyer University, led by Professor Ochola, our Vice Chancellor, for this invitation. It is a very great honor for us to come here for a public lecture. Thank you also, Prof, for visiting our office the other day as we made these arrangements. It is an honor to have these great friends. And I am sure Tom Boyer University is a national university. And I want to test whether we actually are a national university. Can I go ahead? Yes. I'm also Joe Homabe. Odinardi. Moriega. Bulti Naga. Naganin Padada. That is from Masabit and Tana River and, and, and some areas of Isiolo. Buyamori. Buyamori na ende. Nyasae no muya. Chiga kiti onsi. Ainatosha. Naona tuko sao. Thank you very much. Even all the other people who could uh, not recognize what you are saying. We are all Kenyans and I'm glad to be in this national university. Prof. When we talked about this public lecture, I've been thinking about the kind of content that we should tackle this morning. And from where I sit, I thought it is important for us to look, being in a public of higher learning or an institution of higher learning, it is important for us to be academic, but also it is important for us to be light so that we communicate properly to all the comrades who are here. And especially coming to a university named after a man that we all seek to emulate, and a man who, I want you to look internally, who at that age had merited to have a university named after him, at just that age. And therefore, we'll try as much as possible to balance the two so that we have something to take home. I also don't want to talk for long because I would want to give comrades a chance for plenary so that the other issues that we may, we could not have handled in the public lecture, we can get clarity on those issues and our thoughts through the plenary, which I believe is important. But first of all, I want to recognize that I was also a comrade not far away from uh, this time. And I am also a comrade because I'm a student. I'm a student actually in two institutions taking two parallel disciplines currently. 
even with the kind of work that we have in the national platform. My name, of course, you have seen is Dede Nyoro. I am the MP for Kiharu constituency and also the chairman of the Budget and Appropriations Committee in the National Assembly, where it is our responsibility to, appro uh, to appropriate monies to various ministries, departments, and also government institutions. But of course, I was not born in KU where I attended. I was born in a village in Muranga, a small village like majority of you. I can see you are me when I'm here, and especially when I was your age. And I was born in the kind of village that majority of you were born. When I was in class six, I had two ambitions. One, if possible, was to be wealthy. I'm still uh, headed there, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the other one was to be in a place that I can make decisions, and especially what we, we call in raw terms, power. And as of course, as we know, it is most of it in, in regards to politics, because most of our decision making in the national platform are based in politics. So when I was in class six, I decided to have my ambition come closer home faster. So I, I started my first kiosk. And I don't want, I, I, please, I don't want to give this speech like a motivational speech. You know the kind of things people say, I started with an egg, now I'm a billionaire. <laughs> That's not the kind of thing I want. I want something practical. So a classics boy, I would go to some place, buy some things, then I demolished some cafes around our area. I started this, like a small kiosk. Of course, a classics child, with 200 bob in the pocket, hakuna kitu mwalimu anasema. So my concentration, of course, dissipated and dissipated. And of course, I was forced by, by my father to close shop until I was able to handle money and education at the same time. By then, there, there was a challenge in handling both together. So I concentrated, and of course, I did my class eight. Class eight, I was. Um, I was to join a, a fairly good school. Those who come from our area, there's a school called Kiagogo Boys. It's, it's a fairly good school. But unfortunately, I couldn't go because of the many challenges majority of us face, including the comrades here. So I went to a, my, a, a neighboring school, where upon arrival, my two ambitions were still intact. And therefore, in my form one, what I put in my box uh, apart from the other necessities, was Uzi Nasidano Yakusona Biatu. So that is the kind of thing I did in my comradeship in my Form 1. To Form 2, as you know, in many of our high schools, they have clubs science club, debate club, and majority of those clubs are the ones that run canteens in our high schools. And it is basically officials who run the canteen. So what I decided is to join as many clubs as possible and vow to be an official so that I get a chance to run the canteen almost uninterrupted. So I went to science club, became a chairman. I went to drama club, and you can see I'm very far from being a comedian. <laughs> I also became an official there. And because my discipline was not very impeccable, and I was in CU, the CU people knew that I was it. If, if the school was to be asked to take disciplined people to some place, of course I couldn't go. So I went to CA where they didn't know me very well. Those also I become an official to also have as many chances of running the canteen as possible. So after that, that's how I used to get my pocket money and supplement also my fees. To cut the long story short, I cleared from four. I had a balance of 33,000. I was invited back to the same uh, as high school to become a librarian to earn half, and half would clear my fees balance. And then, of course, I went to KU. The same thing lingered in my mind throughout, what I talked about uh, earlier. So when I joined KU, 
in my first year, first sem, the help that we used to get, I paid my full year fee for in my first sem because I had something to do in my second sem. So second sem, I did two things. Those who've been to KU, and I can tell some of you visit for various reasons, which I'll not say because the VC is here. <laughs> there is a place called KM. So I started my first, uh, my, my kiosk there of selling uh, madazi and chakula. But of course, comrades, as you know yourselves, you could eat in my hotel, then tell me to patane kwa class, literally pia uko. So my hotel could not do very well. The same semester, I wanted to buy to become a student leader. And I wanted to be a Congress person in my first year in university. I also didn't manage, I was defeated by around four votes. I almost gave up my two ambitions that I talked about. But again in my second year, I went forth again and by to become the academic secretary in KU, which I was elected in my second year. And of course after that, I went ahead and graduated. When I invited my parents for a Thanksgiving, I actually called them in KU. I didn't make a big ceremony, just some lunch at a conference in KU called KUCC. So I hosted them. My mother came, of course, with the other friends, a few. And when it was my chance to speak, still in my gown, I told my parents, my mother, because my father had departed some time back, I told them that when they go home because the prayers of the parent in Aedanga Vila Kugongwa Nasili, I told them to pray for me not to get a job. Because I knew getting a job was one of the ways of not getting rich. I struggled after graduation, tried a few things, cyber cafe here and there. Then automatically after cyber cafe got into IT, financial services, and then up to the time I got elected as member of parliament for Kiharu, and I still do that business now. So, I'm already giving my speech. Those who are noting, they can note what they want to note. <laughs> but I want also to give a few things before I go to the area of business. Currently, because I believe we have also economic students here and business-related courses are also in, Mas uh, in uh, Maseno and Tomboya University, I want to just to give a little brief about our country because I want to wrap up a few points here and there because the time is short and I want to touch a few things. Being the chairman of budget and being a member of parliament for Kiharu, there are two things I want to dissect around there because we are in a learning institution. And let me start with the first one of being the member for Kiharu before I come to the issue about the country. I've been the MP for Kiharu from 2017. I am glad if there are people here from Kiharu that we can clearly see that changes can actually happen in our villages when we determine to do things. In Kiharu, those who are in day schools, like majority of you, I'm sure you are in day schools, the school fees you pay is only a thousand per term. All the other school fees we subsidize through NGCDF and through the other ways of ingenuity that we have been able to institute. And in those, we are able to rearrange the menu properly so that even those in day schools can eat chapati once in a while, just to make education exciting. Second thing is that in all our public primary schools, which are around 112, all of them we have been able to remake them, and all of them are tiled. For those who come from town areas, this seems like what are you saying, but classes should be tiled. But those who come from rural areas, I am sure you can appreciate what I'm saying, and especially given the kind of schools that we are taking. We do that because education is very important. Without it, most likely, I'll be giving this speech somewhere else, not here. And maybe not in the current uh, position that we hold. So education is important, and we should always remind ourselves of that fact. 
in the national platform, and especially for economic students, Kenya is in a good place where I, 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 from where I sit, but there is a lot of room for improvement, and that is why we are where we are to do those improvements. Last year, the GDP of Kenya for the economists grew by around 5.5% in 2023. There is something we call inflation. It has been coming down to roughly now around 6.3% in the last month. If you look at our currency, you can see good changes happening, and especially when our local currency is strengthening. These things are important. Because whereas we are talking also about our own selves and our ambitions, our ambitions are intertwined with the ambition of our country. And that is why, if you look at the billionaires list, you look at them, they are in some areas, in, in, they are in some isolated geographical areas. Because where you are in terms of a country also determines where your ambitions can stretch. But also, there are also a few areas that I feel we need to do better. And I'll highlight a few. And especially giving scenarios of Kenya comparative to other countries. And you forgive me if I become technical in these first few minutes. And especially I want economic students and all those around economy, political science and such, Maybe this would make much more sense. There are countries that we emulate to be like. One of those countries, when you hear, even you hear comrades, you want visas to go to the US, to the UK, and such other countries. But I believe we can bring those countries home, other than us going to meet them. In terms of the scenarios there, they can come home. US became the kind of U.S. that we know not very long time ago, maybe around 200 years back. U.K. became the kind of U.K. we know in terms of acceleration of economic growth since the glorious revolution. But there are others that I want to delve in more, and especially three countries. One is Japan. Japan, that we know today, started by manufacturing very basic things, plywoods, wigs, things that do not require a lot of technology. Then over time they handed over that banal technology to other countries like South Korea. They then accelerated adoption of technology and adoption of technology comes with increased productivity per person. So what that did is that after handing over plywood and wigs, they went into electronics by that time. So South Korea took up. After South Korea took up in 1960. By 1960, the stories you hear out there are true. If you could go to China in 1960, or you go to South Korea, Kenya, because a Kenyan was better off than a South Korean, than a Chinese, in regards to GDP per capita or income per capita. So South Korea took up the technology and then they did something. And I'm talking to scholars who will be policy makers not too long from today. After they took up South Korea, plywood and wigs and banal technology, which are labor intensive. Economists do this because one of the issues you grapple with is unemployment. And we, before you talk about productivity per person, you first of all want to engage everyone. Because population that is not engaged becomes a problem. And because you are running away from the problem, you first of all, at the basic stage, adopt labor-intensive technologies, labor-intensive manufacturing to mop up more than to produce. Then, after South Korea took up, of course, through the adoption of gradual technology, they also shed off the labor-intensive ones, but also they came up with a very brilliant program. General Park was then the president of South Korea, and he developed what was called um, export-led economy, 
where the economy of South Korea was to be led through exports. For you to grow an economy through exports, you have to grow things that adopt increasing returns, which you can produce in mass and also sell to a bigger market. South Korea then, after setting off, adopting an export-led economy, also came up with something which was equally um, timely, which was creation of public models in terms of private models in terms of private companies, which were to be facilitated directly by government. And I want you to understand that properly. Private companies that were to be facilitated by public resources, money and policies. And they call them Chaibols. The phones majority of you use called Samsung. 50 years ago, 40 years ago, was a trading company selling dried fish. Through adoption of technology, gradually growing, Samsung is now a tech company. It's now not actually more an electronic company, it is more like a tech company. Hyundai, which was one of the tables, assisted deliberately by government, started off as a bicycle repair company. Hyundai. Now they manufacture all the heavy machinery including cars and the rest. That was the model of South Korea. From 1960 to 1976, to 1979 precisely, the exports of South Korea grew by a multiple of 364 times. The current GDP per capita of South Korea are many multiples that of Kenya and many other African countries. There is a country called China, which we love to love and sometimes hate, love to hate. And especially when people are talking about debt, but more of it because of, uh, not of a lack of uh, adequate information. China, can you listen to these comrades? Future government officials, you seated here. Future policy makers, seated here. China has grew in our generation, mine and yours. China in 1976, people were dying out of hunger. Prior to 1976, you see t-shirts written Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong was the leader of China prior to 1976. He came up with something called the Cultural Revolution and the Proletarian Revolution where basically it was more of intense socialism or a command system where the government owned all the factors of production. And therefore, as a farmer, you would farm, but the produce belonged to the larger people. And therefore, what that does, no one is motivated to work hard because you're not working for yourself. As human beings, you are not made to work for others. We are made to work for ourselves. So, proletarian revolution led to many Chinese millions dying out of hunger. Then, look at this. Mao Zedong departed in 1976. From 1976 to 1978, there was a cabal of four leaders who were jostling, including Mao Zedong's wife, on who to be equipped a Mao Zedong. Then, Deng Xiaoping took up the reins of power in China in 1978. What happened? Through deliberate policies, and the reason I'm giving this kind of analogy is for us to see what brains and decision-making can actually do to the fortunes of countries. 1978, around 1980, Deng Xiaoping went to visit uh, other countries. Precisely, there is a time he actually also went to Singapore. He was surprised that people owned fridges, a fridge. Because China was so poor, out of 100 people, only four had fridges at that time. So he opened up the economy through deliberate decision making. Out of 1978, China's growth has been growing unprecedented out of decision making. It's not about oil, it's not about minerals, not about platinum or gold 
that they discovered. They discovered the main gold, which is the brain of a man. From 1978, China grew to the country we know today, which their GDP per capita is now six times that of Kenya. In 1980s, precisely 1990, manufacturing in China accounted for the global only 2%. Currently, 18% of the entire manufacturing of the world is by, done in China. In 2013, only three years to 2015, the amount of concrete that was used in China, building houses and roads, was the entire concrete that was poured in the U.S. for an entire century. But also in those policies, you have phones called iPhones. Nanyini watu wa iPhone, saigine muko na hasira na sisi. Lakini hiyo iPhone ni ya China. By 2020 or thereabout, now they are doing other things in terms of uh, divesting from China. But by 2020, before the decoupling done, being done by the other economies, 100% of iPhones were being assembled in China. So only the brand is US. So you want to iPhone, was it to the If you look at the kind of things that helped China to grow, it was not about mineral resources. It was the minerals of the mind, decision-making, and especially in tandem with the times. I also now want to give the last example, which they may not be far away from us in terms of GDP per capita and income per capita, but they are very great lessons I draw from Nigeria. Nigeria, Kenya may be ahead of Nigeria in many fronts, but I, there is one thing that we must borrow from Nigeria, not as Kenya, but as African countries. Lagos has the highest concentration of black people in the world. You know, the economy of Kenya, the economy of many of the African capitals, you realize, and we are now past that in terms of the politics, but I'm just giving it because it's a reality you realize it's not out of indigenous Africans. You realize they are brothers and sisters who are Kenyans, but may not necessarily be indigenous. How did it go? You hear of Dagote, you hear of such billionaires out of Nigeria. Dagote started by being a trader, importing garments, importing sugar, importing cement. Then after importing, importing and trading, amassed some capital. After amassing this capital, they, he now started building the same things he was importing. He started to manufacture inside Nigeria. Food, for example, rice. You know, many people know Dagote because of cement. He's also one of the biggest farmers in Africa in terms of the farming and agricultural value chains. In Nigeria, there is another business person. You may go and research and go about them later. There is a company called BUA. BUA. For business uh, students, please, um, because there is no time to amplify so many things, you can note and you can get more information later. BUA is owned by somebody called Absuamad Labiu, a Nigerian also. Why am I mentioning these people? There is one misconception we usually have, Kenya and Africa. When we see rich people, we actually turn them into enemies of society. This should be honored going forward. Because out of the capital that got created out of trading, out of the capital created by review out of trading, themselves, they started manufacturing the same commodities in Nigeria. That does a lot of things. Import substitution. This elevates the local currency. It gives more command in terms of the value chains and reliability within the internal domestic value chains. After that, they manufacture cement. They do food. They also mill flour. They also are in salt and others. Out of the capital created and the profit created, 
out of selling cement. The same two gentlemen, one is starting the biggest refinery in Africa, the other one is the second biggest, still in Nigeria. Now, this is the point I want to make. Business people, Kenyans, economists, when a business person makes profit, who is, actual, the own, who the, is the actual owner of that profit? Let me paraphrase. When a business person in Kisumu City, in Homabe Town, in Nairobi, in Mobasa, when that business person makes profit, whose profit is it? I don't want an answer, think about it. When Dakota makes profit out of trading and then starts manufacturing cement and then builds the biggest refinery in Africa, in essence, who is the actual owner? of this profit made by Dagote. It is the people who get jobs out of the opportunities created by these profits. When you make profit as a business person, you can only eat too much. You can't sleep on two beds or five beds. You cannot drive five cars together. Even if you own private jets, you cannot fly inside two of them yourself. You can eat in Serena lunch, you go to Wetsat for dinner, you go to Dubai for breakfast, but you can only eat and consume too much. The actual beneficiaries of the profits created by business people are the economists and the people in those economies. Congress power. Wow. And that is the kind of frame that we must start having. That we must start appreciating the business people of Kenya. Because out of that business person, if it was self-interest, they already have enough. The profits they make out of their mind. And one of the factors of production nowadays is actually entrepreneurship. That entrepreneurship spirit is a factor of production. Must be nurtured. Because the profits made out of these companies benefit the economy more than the owners of those businesses. Let me repeat again, citing a few examples. The profits made by Tesla in the US, the profits made by Samsung in South Korea, the profits made by CRBC in China, the profits made by Sunland in South Africa, the profits made by Atijarawafa Bank, the profits made by Zenith Bank in Nigeria, that profit does not belong to the owners of the bank. It belongs actually to the economy because it capacitates the economy to employ more and necessitates more to become active agents of the economy. And therefore, I am dwelling on that more because for Kenya to change, the frame of mind has to change. For Africa to change, we must put weight and appreciation where it belongs. The real people who must be appreciated is actually not politicians. It is business people. They are creators of, of opportunities. They are multipliers of opportunities. As I went up this technical issue, again for economists and all of us as Kenyans, just a few things which I believe because a public lecture, you share your thoughts. Some of the things that we must do on top of what I've just enumerated. Kenya, as I said, is growing at not a bad pace. 5.5% is not so bad. It's actually 28th fastest growing economy in the world. But are there challenges? Many. Why? For a low-level economy like Kenya, for us to grow at a level where every Kenyan is feeling the growth, we have to raise to the double G uh, digit. We have to accelerate our growth. We have to grow more. We have to grow faster. What should happen? Just a few things. Political scientists, historians who are here, if you start the countries, you realize three things are critical for a growth of any country. For a growth of a modern economy, number one, we must have a strong state. A strong state based on merit, 
based on meritocracy. A strong state is important. Then, accountability must be there. And that is why we go to elections most of the time. Accountability is usually through democracy. And then there is rule of law. That is why these institutions are very important. But, there are also green facts. One of the facts, if you study all the countries that I've talked about, very few countries develop when they are fragmented. Historians, I, I'm giving you some homework. You form part of the Katuan, maybe. <laughs> Very few countries grow when they are fragmented. Because there is a state on this side, which is institutions. But if there is a nation on the other side, which is culture and people. Historians, I hope you know those differences. But there is a country called Kenya. Country is coordinates, is boundaries. There's nothing else. You define Kenya as a country by its boundaries. There is a republic called Kenya. Republic is self-determination. The fact that we determine who is our leader, that makes us the Republic of Kenya. But then there is a state. There is a state called Kenya, which is the state apparatus, the institutions. But then there is a nation. What is a nation? Nation is homogeneity. Nation is shared values. Nation is shared culture. Nation is a shared identity. <coughs> Unfortunately, most of us, like Kenya and many African countries, we got ourselves to the Jipata, Kenya Tuko. So that our country called Kenya, we do not share too much in common with our fellow Kenyans. If you go and talk about Nigeria, how did Nigeria become Nigeria? The first Nigeria that we know came about in 1914. How? It came out, out of the margin merging of the North Nigeria and the South Nigeria. South Nigeria itself was out of merging of the Tana Delta and uh, I think Lagos. Why am I talking about these things? Nigeria has got a lot of oil. Yani, well, that you don't need to go look for. It is already bequeathed unto you. But does it help that country? DRC has minerals, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, yet one of the poorest in terms of the poverty index. Why are those paradoxes? It may not be entirely, but it is important that for a country to take off, we need to look inward and actually come up with an identity that makes us homogeneous as a country. Other countries did so, like uh, Tanzania. They have more tribes than Kenya. Yet, when you go to the streets of Dar es Salaam and you ask a, 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 a Tanzanian, Unatoka Kabira Gani, they ask you, Are you Kenyan? But now, other stark examples like the one I've talked about, Nigeria, just look at the disparity. Disparity in terms of shared values. A person from the north, like the other day I went to South Africa, I was in a taxi, then I asked some guy there, which country do you come from? I could tell he's Nigerian through the accent. I asked him, are you Nigerian? The guy stopped his taxi, told me to stop abusing him. He's Nigerian, but he associates himself as being a Biafra. He told me I am Biafra, I am not Nigerian. But his passport is Nigerian. That is how majority of the African countries are fragmented. That even before we take off, we first of all have inward squabbles amongst ourselves. 
When are we going to get the energy to take over and compete when we are discussing about this tribe and the other? This has to come to an end for Kenya to be a modern state. A person from Kwale must feel at home in Homabe. A person from Nyeri must feel at home in Mobasa. A person from Masabit must be at home in Tana River in Kisi. A person from Nyamira must be at home in Muranga. That is the kind of Kenya that will take off. Other things, just look at this. And I talk about this because something must be done. When we are making budgets, we usually get a brief of the Kenyan economy because budget is a policy also. So, part of the brief, just look at this. Kenyan economy, what is it? When you talk about GDP, what are we talking about? You can measure an economy through income or expenditure. For economists, when you measure an economy, the first category you measure primary production, which is agriculture, fisheries, mining. In Kenya, it accounts for 17% primary production. Industry, transport, manufacturing, it accounts for around 18%. Service, banking, insurance, hospitality, it accounts for 65% of our GDP. But why am I mentioning these things? Why? The same brief you see, primary production and especially agriculture employs 70% of the rural population in Kenya. And 40% of Kenyans are employed in agricultural value chains. Why is that important also? 17% of our GDP employs 40% and 70% of the rural population. That looks like a paradox. 17% is carrying the weight of 70% in rural areas. Service industry, yes, it's a big employer, but you see, it accounts for 65% of our GDP. There is something we must do. Our economy has to shift from primary production because by those two figures it is clear that productivity in primary production is too low. And for Kenya to grow, the 50 million Kenyans have to grow because it is the submission of their productivity that we report as GDP. GDP is not created in Nairobi or in a government office. GDP is created by farmers, by manufacturing, by service industry. So for that to increase, every worker in an industry, their productivity per person has to go up. Our subsistence, majority of our agriculture and primary production is subsistence. We have to shift our economy from subsistence to a capitalistic economy, and especially in rural areas for Kenya to actually grow double digit. Some will ask, why are you talking about these things when you are in government? I'm also talking to people who will be in government very soon. <laughs> and these are the comrades of Tomboya University and Maseno University. <laughs> Some will be elected as members of parliament, others will be governors, others will be PSS, others CSS, Lakini mukivika hapo, usipandisha kiyo ya gari tamadani. The other thing, which we are also doing, some of these things we are doing our bit, but it is a continuous journey. The other thing you mentioned, GDP for it to grow. You have to grow consumption. You have to grow investment. And you have to grow government expenditure. And then you have to grow net exports. For economists, you know those things, y is equals to c plus i plus g plus x minus m. Or the other polypoly. Just like this, y, y is the economy. 
Why is the economy? Is equals to I'll give you two formulas, you go research further. The first one, either the disorder belly, call it a Greek. A Greek is in bracket primary. That's called primary production. Anything you produce, yani vile unaipata divo iko, kama mahiti. Vile unaipata kwa saba, unaikula ivo. The only value addition is cooking. So that is primary production. Plus, I'm still on formula number one. Y is equals to a Greek bracket primary plus secondary. Secondary, you can put down there. It is anything about manufacturing and anything about transport. Also, we put water and electricity there. Lastly, plus tertiary. Tertiary in bracket service. Now in Kenya, that agri or primary, primary production is agriculture, mining, fisheries, and forestry. Those four. For economists, you may note. What we call agri is not just agriculture. Is everything in primary production, agriculture, mining, fisheries, and forestry. That account for roughly 17% of our GDP. The second one, secondary, accounts for 18% of our GDP. And the last one accounts for 65% of our GDP. The second formula, the second one is Y, just write like Y is equals to C. C is consumption plus I, which is investment. Both are private, private consumption and private investment. Plus G. G is government expenditure plus X. Work a bracket plus X, then bracket before X, minus M, then bracket. That is export minus imports. That is what we call net exports. Always remind yourself about those poly future policy makers. Because everything you do rotates around there in terms of the national decision making. So Kenya, for this Y to increase, you can already tell. You either increase Y, I, G or X minus M. Import substitution, you grow things that will accelerate production. I don't want now to go further in these economic jargons. I want to go as I finish to things that we can relate with more closer home. Nataka tufanyi hesabu, comrades. Kidogo tu. And I want, to, I want us now to almost get into some sort of plenary. Will you come with a Konaman new t shirt? Good at Avadan. Good at Bro. Yeah. When I do a video to refine a weekend. I want a lady to come. A lady. A lady. She's there. Let's clap for them. And I want another gentleman. And another lady. Comrades. Please come, somebody come with a microphone. The other microphone. Nataka tufanyi hesabu, comrades. Na hii public lecture, hile maneno siri ya zimeisha. Hiyo yo maikonome kwanza tumaliza. Hata ni siku maliza yote. Ni meona hii, itaokea na economic students peke yao. Nataka tufanyi public lecture pamoja. What's your name? Where is the mic? What's your name? 
Vea, vea cómo le da. Aquí a música que arma todo. Sasa la tuya ni mota ni wakiharo sahi. Aya, tuende bere bro. Eh, uko huchia? I am in a third year student. Which course? Special needs education. Let me ask you, bro. How old are you? 22 years. When you are 28, you get a good account again. Which is it? Mulaiga. Hey, Aki Niniwatu. Niniwatu, who can have a person Nakama Mulaiga, you know how much Mulaiga is, eh? Yes. You know? Yes. One acre in all Mulaiga is 200 million. So, to tell you, I'm going to tell you for our mathematics. To put the estate kapaya. 50 million a acre, is it? Yes. Now, listen to this, gentlemen and ladies. <laughs> this, KWS, my brother here is in business. Three million vehicle, but this is Lexus, as you know. <laughs> this is... Ata tumeteremuka kitogo, pahari 50 million. Let's actually not talk about 50 million, guys. Let us talk about and just a nested where a plot sio kama hii ya Mudhaiga tukuje here 7 million tukuje tu hapo i want you to us to go together so at tx weka hapo 6 million so you started working at what age 25 you start working at 25 tx sio lexus tx mutumba is seven million. Make a seven. A plot. A plot. See a number plot. Seven million. That is fourteen million. Let me ask you, my brother. Ukitoka hapa leo, we are living in a bank Kenya. Sai as a fresh graduate. Ufanywe manager, operations manager. How much is the salary? Anyone with an idea? Yeah. Gross. Can somebody do for me net? That is gross. Can you somebody do for me gross? If you are earning 200,000. <laughs> so, so, to so, the 120, 140, 120. Right, 120 there. <laughs> I want us to, I want an, a very easy discussion. That's why I call how I'm going to happen. Can you do for me 14 million divided by 120,000? Somebody. No, no, which I divide the Zuri. 14 million, million is going to be sita. Divide by seven, a rough note is going to be sita. 120. So, one, two, then a note is this correct? Ah, very good. 116? Now, divide by 12, because those are months. Divide by 12. How much? 9.7. Simuna soma kitu ina itu rounding off. Yo ina kuja nini? Who you mutu at 25 wako how old? 25. Ajani kujivani hamu uza mfanyi ya zabu. 25 ukiogeza miaka kumi. So ukona TX na proti na hauna nyumba. Tuko pamoja? What I want you to live here. Okisahau yu maneno yote nilisema ya GDP. Ladies and gentlemen, you never came to Tom Boya to look for a job. You never came to Tom Boya to work for anyone. You never came to Tom Boya for your living standards to remain the same. You never came to Tom Boya to be part of the problem. You came to Tom Boya to become an employer to become wealthy, and to become rich. 
Kio hesabu tumefanya. Wewe unaona hiyo inakupeleka wealthy ama poverty? Now, ask yourself, that farm you want to go and work in, was it created by a robot or a person or did it get itself there? This company you want to graduate from Tomboy and go and work. So it came from where? Where did it come from? From a river? It is okay, kama muti ikagro. How did it appear? Somebody did it through a deliberate decision. The people I'm talking to today at Tomboya University are people who are not graduating to go and tarmac. They are people who will be graduating to go and start their own businesses. <laughs> These are not people, if truly, the kind of ambition you've listed here, if you truly you mean it, you can clearly see here. This is not my calculator that has done this month. It is your calculator. That by 35, yes, you'll have a TX, which will be maybe white in color. You'll also have a plot, but you'll be sleeping in that vehicle. Because you don't have a house. You start now beginning a journey of building the house. And here we are talking about something called the Teris Paribas. You know one thing I've assumed here? That all these people are working. You know what I mean? They are saving everything. <laughs> you know what I mean, eh? Yes. I'm assuming everyone here is saving everything. At the entire salary. Which is also an assumption that cannot hold. Even in economics. I'm also coming from Kihan. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I come to the cross, as I come to the cross, I read the beam. Somebody will ask. How is youth and taking part in governance in what you've talked about? Many times you have come to confuse that the only leadership we can do is leadership in politics. There is a lot of other leaders that are needed out there in our economy, and especially in the business front. And as you craft what you want to do in, with your life in the future, I want you at your free time to go and Google for free Forbes magazine. And when you Google Forbes magazine, go and check the richest, wealthiest people in the world in terms of their net worth. You realize there is one person there called Bernard Arnold. What is his company? Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. What do they do? Watches, bags, expensive accessories. What is associated with those kind of purchases? They are irrational purchases. You don't buy a watch out of the value in use. You buy the watch out of the value in exchange and for ostentation. That when I wear, people recognize who I am. Unfortunately, not many people actually know their prices. So you wear a 10 million watch, but then it's only you who knows their, 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 their worth. <laughs> Number two in that list, I may not follow through all of them. Let me just mention, and not in any particular order. You'll get Elon Musk or Elon, Elon Musk. What is their account? Their company is Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink. By the way, Elon Musk is the founder of PayPal, the PayPal you use when you're doing academic writing to be paid. It was started by Elon Musk. Then he sold it. What do they do? Electric cars, SpaceX going to space, and internet issues, what, is, what can you call that category of sector? Maybe 
automotive or automobiles and IT. Three, Jeff Bezos. What is the company of Jeff Bezos? What is it? Amazon. What is the sector of Amazon? What is Amazon? What, what sector is Amazon? IT. There is a lot of other things, logistics in it, but it's basically an IT company. The other one is Rally Page, one of the founders of Google, 107 billion US dollars. The other one is Warren Buffett. What is his company? Berkshire Hathaway. Where does Berkshire Hathaway invest? They are the number one investors in Apple. Their biggest investment, more than half of the investment of Berkshire Hathaway, is in Apple. What is Apple? A phone. Food sector? IT. Bill Gates follows Microsoft. Which sector is that? Is it real estate? Is it manufacturing? Is it agriculture? Is it dairy? Is it fisheries? Michael Bloomberg follows data. They have TV stations and the rest, but their main business is data. And especially useful data, like the one I'm citing, but more market related. The other one is Indian, Mukesh Abani. Which company? Reliance Industries. Which one? Petrochemicals, ETC. But what has brought him in the line branch of, of, of the Forbes list? It is a company called Geo. Which sector? IT, telecoms. The other one is Steve Balmer, the former CEO of Microsoft. So Microsoft. Then there is Mayer's family. Do you know which company is it? It's called El Oriel. What do they do? Luxuries. The other one is Rally Page. If you go to the next one, you'll get somebody called Amancio Ortega. Which company? Zara. What do, they, do Zara do? Are they in mining? Are they in real estate? No. What? Ostentatious purchases. If I don't end anything there, you already have the point. When you are graduating, you have to associate with the industries of the moment. The industries of the moment, you don't need to struggle knowing. You just look at where is most value being created. Is it a coincidence that 10 years ago, this Forbes list was a tech person and a finance person? 30 years back were industrialists. It is not by coincidence. It is by being in the right place at the right time. At the right time, it is you to fashion. The right place, it is also you to fashion. But how do you do it? The best laboratory is history. Just look at where you are, where has what has happened in the past, so that you position yourself properly. All I've said there is that if you look at all the billionaires of the world, they are either, the top 20, they are either in tech or they are in luxuries. Tom Boyer, can you just imagine, especially those people who are in here, see your son and comrades, because comrades in the 22, 23. Just imagine, at my age, Tom Boyer was already gone one year. 38, and you look at the impact Tom Boyer created. And then most of the times, I see people saying how youth in Kenya are taking their positions. There is no lazier generation of youth than the current generation. None. Why? You call me here as a young person. But the young person of history are tomboyers and the others. What had they achieved at our age? At your age as a comrade, at 23, Tom Boyer was already a national leader. He was already leading Kenya African Union. At 33, he was already a minister who was pushed even for higher positions. 
But then, is it just on boy alone? If you look historically, you read about French Revolution. The person who led the French Revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte, became a general before that. He became an emperor at that time. Napoleon Bonaparte. If you look at people like Nelson Mandela, he could have become president much later, but his involvement in the national politics in his 30s. Mwai Kebaki became the leader of Kanu as the CEO at around 30 years old. Look at the people we can relate with very well. A young Nyongo from Yakisumu. People like our current president. At the age of the comrades who are sitting here, they were already doing, uh, they were already doers of this. But then even the current situation, go to France currently. How old is Emmanuel Macron? He became the president of France at Bari 4042. Do you know the age of the Prime Minister of France? Even before you talk about the Prime Minister of France, you need to Google what is the GDP of France before you answer that question. The Prime Minister is 34 year old. And he was not first from a village in or a nested in France. No. He was already an MP at 28. That's the Prime Minister of France. And we are here saying, we are comrades of Tomboya University, we have time, we organize ourselves to Najipanka, we have time. You have no time, my comrades. If it is starting, you start now, not tomorrow. But others also have ascended. Not, we can't talk about the method, but they have arrived. I'm not talking about the method. The current president of Burkina Faso, I'm not talking about the process, how he got there. Raoul is how much? How old? He's 35. But how old was Sankara, Thomas Sankara? Thomas Sankara became president at 35, at 35 years old, already president of Burkina Faso. 34, 35, he was already president of Burkina Faso. What am I trying to say? Even up I met just here in Ethiopia, became Prime Minister at 42. Others are not, also in this position, I'm not talking about how he got it. If you go to Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, the current um, crown prince, you can literally say the ruler there. Because the king, uh, he, he does most of the functions. We are actually intimates, including the month of Baal. But what is the GDP of Saudi Arabia? You can check later. What am I trying to say? Sometimes we look at our ages and we think a time is coming for us to be useful in our societies, in our localities, in our countries, in our continent. That time is not coming. That time came. But then, as we do that, and I'm talking now, especially the African countries, and especially citing some of my friends, for us to be credible as youthful generation of leaders, we have to start with clear-cut, pristine policies. Policies that you don't struggle to explain. There is a crop of African youthful leaders coming up, and we wish them the best. When we go to South Africa, there is Julius Malema. Do I believe in the policy of EFF? Maybe there is room for discussion from where I sit. Because we have to keep on gradually differentiating between campaigning to win and governing. So that as you come up as leaders from Tomboya University, your guiding principle must not be you becoming a leader, must be you becoming an agent of change in the economy of Kenya and Africa. When you put yourself first, then you have no policy. You become a populist. After populism, you are given power 
you do not know what to do with power. When you hold power and you do not know what to do with power, power burns you. And I am hopeful that the current crop of people who are coming up are coming up with good policies. I have cited South Africa. We have seen young movement, movement of young people, of course led by EFF. You go to a place like Uganda, our neighbors. You see a young man, Bobby Wine, challenging the authority. But then we forget one thing. We call Bobby Wine a young man. We forget what age did the current president actually become president. You know, sometimes because of the current, the current, I mean, because of the, the current, what we see now is what is there now. We forget what has been. Yes, there is a youthful leader in uh, Uganda, but then we seem like he's moving too fast. But he's moving too fast against what? The current president of the same country, at what age? Did he, was he Bobby Wine of the current situation? You go to Nelson Chamisa of Zimbabwe. At that one, he was already a minister. Senegal are having election this week. There is a young man called Osman Sonko who was actually restricted from being on the ballot but his party is sponsoring another song called there. What am I trying to say by mentioning these people? As the young people of Kenya and Africa, the best gift we can give to our continent is not for us to be ambitious, for ambition's sake. It is for us to place the ambitions of our country ahead of our personal ambitions. And if you place the ambition of Tom Boya University ahead of yours, you think about Tom Boyer University. You talk about what you are building. You talk about the courses you are offering, how they can become better. The young people of Africa, and I am glad, majority are on that line. We must think about our countries first. And our countries first is to think about clear-cut policies that can transform our economies. Because our secular economies as uh, uh, African countries are what become the economy of Africa as a continent. And with those many remarks, I thank you very much. May God bless you. Yeah, you can have a seat. Uh, I don't want to spoil uh, the best of the information that we've forgotten, which is going to propel this institution, this country, and the people who are seated in front of us. The young people are leaders of today, not tomorrow. I always tell my students, you are leaders of today and not tomorrow. And because you are the leaders of today and tomorrow, you must do the right thing. It's not negotiable. You cannot lead today if you don't play by the rules. And that has been reiterated, and therefore, I don't want to uh, spoil the, the nice speech. Having said that, Chief Guest, allow me also to appreciate our partners. We have three guests who have come to visit Tongue University. Not only today, they have been here, and they are going to be our partners for quite a long time. From the United Kingdom, Scotland, and... Robert Gordon's University. They've come to grace this occasion and they said they had to come and listen to you within their business schedule. So I would want to see Professor Stevens, uh, Dr. Neil Gibson, and Alistair Logan. So they are with us and I want to recognize their presence because we want to also encourage our partners and collaborators to come and be with us to help us this build this beautiful country. Having said that, uh, I would wish to take this opportunity before we uh, uh, do a vote of thanks. We have just uh, uh, some, some, some things that we want to give the guest uh, uh, for, to remember about Tomboya. They are not gifts, 
but just to remind you that uh, uh, Tom Boyer exists. And when you're here, you think about the logo. Uh, Chief Guest, I don't know whether you, you had critically looked at this logo, and what you see, you see the primary production. You see fish there. You see water there. You see the hills, the environment around it. So we are an institution of blue economy. This is where we also want to take this country forward. And we are also now not looking at fish in terms of fishing, but we are thinking about the fish tech. How do you value chain this fish that we have in this natural environment to help this country grow forward? And you have challenged the students to make sure that they become job creators in the fish tech because you can't associate yourself with a, with a brand and you are not doing anything that promotes that brand. And that is why we have that particular logo. So we wish to, uh, sir, if you don't mind, receive uh, uh, one of these wonderful bags uh, before a vote of that. Yes. I think before that, uh, I we came with several guests. I request them to start. This gentleman is called Kemani. I was with him in KU. Geoffrey, please come and also introduce the others. Geoffrey, I was also with him as a comrade from university. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Felix Okech. I'm a lawyer. I was also a student leader at KU together with Donald Bodini. Uh, we are here together with my colleagues. We have uh, Jared Oriada. Please come, Victor. Uh, Jemima. Okay, we can just wait from there. Yeah. So, Jared, please wait. Uh, Jemima. Um, we have Sylvester yeah, from Jakash. We have Jared from Moroni. We are also with him at KU. So, we will we we we'll also mentor you as Tom Boyer. So other, apart from myself, Kewi is ready to mentor Tomboy University. Thank you. <laughs> this is Geoffrey Ajiki. He is also an investor here in Kisumu. Asante Nisana. So after the gifts, because they are the, 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 the chief guest is quite tight, uh, after the gifts, he'll sit and is ready to um, consult and to take at least five questions from the audience five burning questions so that after that uh, he can find time uh, to go back to Nairobi. He must be in parliament by three, and that's the reason why he's very tight. So we wish to... Where's the DVC? So we, we, we are giving this in remembrance of Tom Boyer uh, university to the chief guests so that when he goes uh, I know immediately he reaches home mama will pick this and take it away uh, so that he can use it as one of her souvenirs for the family thank you very much God bless uh, we also wish to give uh, a, another present to the vice chancellor of Masino University We also want him to go and give the mama. This is not his bag. <laughs> yeah, Professor Mbundi, Vice Chancellor of Masena University. We also want to give the county commissioner, uh, Home Bay County, Bwana Lelan. Then we also want to give our guests from the UK, uh, Professor and his team, so that you can be able to. Uh, keep on coming to support us as an institution. Uh, yes, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ned. Thank you. And, and finally, we also want to give the young man who has also made this occasion a success, Geoffrey. I know he's shocked because of 
You are you know, his leader of today, not tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you very much, and may God bless you. So we want to open this for five also questions, which are burning. I know there are many things that all of us would have said, but we can't dis distribute that. My faculty, if you have anything from Tom Boya, then I can see uh, the students raising up their hands. So I will leave one man here. Where is the lady? It's only men. There's a lady there. And then, so long as your questions are short, they can be many. But make sure that you are very, we start from this side. Let's start with him. So you, one question, one question. Thank you. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, I have a question. Because uh, the MP of Kihal is here, and we comrades, we, some of us don't get the bursary. I'm David. And we would like to know whether the MP or the constituencies that they read, is there a way they can change the policy Instead of students going for the money to the MPs, the way they help give us the money, can the constituency put our money in one basket? We can apply it online and get that money. My name is David Mondiwashiori, a student at Maseno University pursuing international relations with diplomacy with IT. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Amoy Isaac, a second year student of Hawaii University. Uh, to the chief, chief guest, the question is, uh, as a lawmaker, which mechanism are you putting in place to end patrimonial leadership in Kenya and encourage other youths in leadership so that we can bring more sanitation in politics? Then. Thank you for the question. My name is Sarah Meneka, a second year student taking political science in Maseno University. So my question was this. Uh, I've noticed that most of the people in our societies nowadays, they are making a lot of mistakes, they are making a lot of poor decisions due to lack of knowledge. And when Honorable Dean Dignoro was making the speech, I noticed that he was uh, portraying a lot of knowledge in him. So it would be good if as a nation we strive to make sure that everyone in the society uh, gets a lot of knowledge, mostly in politics, science and economic development, because even our parents back at home, they blame the government, yet it's some things which they, they just need a little knowledge to understand them. <laughs> And my question is, how can we monetize the uh, entertainment industry being an artist? Thank you. Lady behind you. Where is the lady? Lady. Any lady? Yeah, here yeah, she is. Uh -huh. you my name is Grace Erimo, taking Bachelor of Business Administration. And my question is, since the MP has said about the policy, what are you putting across to ensure that you are not adopting policies from other countries which are not applicable in our country? Chief guests, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good, good afternoon. My name is Maureen Molly. I take education at UIT English Lit. I want to ask about the issue of hostels to the comrades of Tomboya University. We need hostels as an institution because of their 
first years who are going to come. As you can see, our population is increasing rapidly. So we need, you know, yeah. Then you say that this gen we have an, our generation is really lazy. So like, how can you encourage us in terms of in terms of like knowing what you are supposed to do as leaders of this university? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Honorable Mosewe from Migori County. I would like to ask one particular question, especially to the youthful leader Nindi, who is the speaker. You've talked about uh, the difference between the nation, state, and government. In retracing Tom Weir's footsteps, I believe Tom Weir distinguished himself as a believer of nationhood. Playing the book, okay? Um, do you believe that the current crop of youthful leaders, because I haven't quite seen that in the National Assembly and the Senate as well, uh, would emulate uh, Tom Weir's vision of nationhood. And nationhood, uh, as you uh, put it, starts from very simple things. For instance, I have noticed, the question already has, I have noticed that you parked your car where there's no slot for parking. That is not nationhood. Do you think that is achievable in Kenya? How long does it take and how long will it take? Thank you. The responses, and if we have more time, two more. Okay, a lady and a gentleman. Uh, thank you to our chief guest. My name is Ochino Danmako, I'm a fourth year student at Chomba University. And uh, you being the chair of the National Budget Committee, I want to ask this question that you being uh, a young leader, how do you ensure that there is accountability and transparency in government, especially the allocation and utilization of public funds? Thank you. Yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm winding up the student side. This side one, then I give faculty, then one, one student side. Okay. Thank you so much. I have a question to our Honorable Ingeniora. The question is uh, how can you ask you uh, My name is David Wadera, uh, third year student at Tomboya University, taking special needs education with IT. So I have a question. How can we monetize the social media platform to, to make the youth uh, achieve the transformation of leadership and good governance agenda? I think uh, I'll be very brief if you permit. Uh, the issue of David and Basari, I agree with you. We may need to think about a manner where comrades from Aseno do not have to go to each and every constituency to pick a physical form. However, some universities are already, some constituencies are already doing that. There is a colleague of mine from Moana constituency where they actually do online application and the adoption to other constituencies is quite high. However, also in some other constituencies, we don't require the comrade per se to come and fill. Their guardians and parents can also fill the form. We do this because uh, we also audited. When the auditor comes to our office, they have to look at the person who gave bursary, who told you they wanted. So there has to be a physical application form. But I think uh, as you propose, um, uh, instead of arguing with technology, the best way is to adopt. Isaac, uh, you asked a very, that, that guy must be from CI. <laughs> yeah, patrimonio. Bugoma. Ah, very good. He asked, if he had time, he would have given us quite a brief about leadership, about patrimonial leadership. I agree, actually, with most of the sentiments uh, raised here. Patrimonial leadership serves a few. 
deserves the owner of the power. And it looks down. Because patrimonial is where the leader is at the vantage point. You are looking down on the people you are reading. But however, in Kenya that is changing rapidly. Being a, a situation where we are a pure democracy, you realize majority of people elected are actually a representative of the people who elect. That's when you, why you get all disciplines and all backgrounds being elected. But I, as you raise the question, there is always room for improvement and especially making sure that his uh, leadership is based on uh, meritocracy. Sarah from Aseno, about knowledge, thank you very much for the compliment. In Kenya, there is no scarcity of areas to read and learn. However, generally they, are, they usually say, if you want to hide something, you put it in a book. And this is where I see a lot of opportunity for young people. When you become a person who seeks after knowledge, there is no way you will not make it. Because the people who seek for this knowledge are too few. You will be competing with very few people. Majority of you study for exams. After that, Imeisha. And just to cite, when I was in KU, there used to be a person selling magazines up at gate. Forbes, Economist. Part of these things I've been talking about, I started reading about them in KU. I would, I would go borrow an economist magazine, read without kupaka uchafu, then I return to him, and I use the camera, the Forbes magazine, the same. Seek after knowledge. If you are doing criminology, you know nothing about NATO, you know nothing about the, issue, the geopolitics that is happening in the world, you need to do much more. If you are studying political science, and I ask you um, who is the president of Ivory Coast, you have no idea what, when were Russian elections. By the way, me see. Election in Russia is When? Just in unison. I hope everyone knows. When? Russian election was yesterday. When is the when is the month the US election equal which month? Or maybe year. Let me start with year. This year. This year. Yes. Who are the candidates? <laughs> Trump and who are you supporting? Trump. 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 So, <laughs> so if you are in political science, it, this knowledge, it makes, it makes education exciting. When I'm reading about a merger and acquisition happening somewhere, UBS is buying some other bank, I feel like I'm in holiday. Because you've already created a lot of interest in yourself. If you are in tech and you don't know about what is happening in the tech world, in the venture capital world, in the private equity world, then you need much more knowledge to make even your education more exciting. Eric from Tomboya, thank you for the compliment. How to monetize uh, uh, entertainment. This one for, was for entertainment. <coughs> entertainment in Kenya, my take. Uh, entertainment ownership, I put it in the same basket. I ordered a book when I was in campus in second year, called How to Succeed in High School. I learned one thing, the same thing learned by entertainers. There is no critical mass in Kenya to sustain an entertainer. There is no critical mass. There is no critical mass to sustain an author. You have to venture out and look for the bigger market. The beauty with technology, it demolishes barriers. It demolishes boundaries. So you can only capitalize on technology and platforms to access other markets beyond the people you see and the people you interact with. And that is why YouTube comes in handy and all the other platforms. You saw what was happening in State House yesterday when Facebook uh, management came and that will also be a platform for monetizing entertainment. But don't think about who's a, who's a 
the, the normal things, the physical gadgets. It will not make any money for you. The bigger market must take and especially platform. Uh, Grace, about uh, the lady who was clapped, uh, about taking policies. The policies I was giving, the, the case scenarios, was not necessarily to copy. The only thing I wanted us to copy is one, deliberate decision making. Many times you are elected as a student leader, you let things be at the little bit of pereka. Many times you are elected as an MP, you do things the way an MP should do, attend a function where MPs attend, you don't bother your mind by thinking harder. I was just trying to say, fortunes of countries are changed by deliberate decision making. Not necessarily copying what South Korea did, or China, but copying how they did it. And how they did it is deliberately looking at their comparative advantage by that time, looking at where they can copy a few more things, add them together, and then using the local resources and scenarios, come up with your own policy. The other one from... There is a lady who talked about hostels. I agree. Professor Ochora is also a speaker of the comrade. I think he is your spokesperson because he's very persistent in asking us to put money for hostels in the budget. And that message I'll pass to the President of the Republic of Kenya today. Because Tomboya University needs at least to house first years and second years. Yeah. And maybe later, everyone else. But it's now my burden. Why? I am now your friend. Na hiyo, siyo tafadhali. Mimi nimekua rafiki yenu kwa guvu. Mutaitikia hiyo maneno? Aya. Then... Nation state, my honorable Osewe, yes, I agree with you <laughs> on many things, except the fact that nationhood is about homogeneity, it is about shared values, it is about shared culture. Maybe where the car was parked is about chapter six. <laughs> But I agree with you that Tom Boyer stood for one Kenya. One Kenya meaning we must cease looking at somebody and referring to them as this against the other one. Every Kenyan must start being a Kenyan. And when you know what, what countries do for homogeneity, to look for a common shared value, common shared even language, it can be also man-made. You know, static identities are the ones that are toxic. Like, I was born in this tribe. That is a very static identity. I am from this religion. That is a very static identity. There is nothing I can do about it. I would rather we are talking about classes. Because you can, there is mobility of moving from this class to the other. But there is no mobility from moving from this time to the other. And those are the kind of identities that are backward. And within the next generation, we must do away with those kind of identities for Kenya to truly be one as nation, as a nation of Kenya. Um, Otieno, accountability as the budget chairman. We do a lot, by the way. Kenya is not short of institutions, by the way. Institutions to make sure rule of law is followed, there is accountability. We are not sort of institutions. In fact, at some point, I think Kenya is over bureaucratized. We have so much, the government is too huge that I feel we actually need to trim it down. 
Look at, for example, the issue of what you've raised. There is the SEC, Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. There are courts. There is CID. There is basically almost a dozen institutions to enforce that. So the issue for me, my opinion, is that we also need to go back to the question about a nation so that we have something that we value. If you go to Japan, they have something called Keizen, which somebody or everyone there feels they should be part and parcel of doing what it postulates. But in Kenya, we place money to at a very tight position that everything else manifests. And I think that needs to change so that we recalibrate. And that is the same reason, possibly, you see in Africa, young people here, if I say anyone who wants to become a politician to raise their heart, most of you will raise. Why? Apart from serving the people, people also see it as a way of extracting political rent. That the, if you ask about, other than the examples that I gave, the richest people in Africa, their number one asset is political power. I think that is not very good. Um, if I got the name correctly, Buenavadera, social media, yes, in many instances it's used even politically. What you see in the US Congress around TikTok is also political because the current world now, the narratives are shaped to a large extent through social media. And therefore, it's now you to know where to capitalize on it other than to complain about it. Otherwise, because uh, I think we have wrapped up, I want to... Okay, okay, okay. If they don't talk, all of them will kill okay. <laughs> can also come here, I think. You can come here. Thank you, Mwishmiwa. My name is Dr. Victor Aliata. I'm a faculty member in the Business and Economics Department. And uh, from your speech or from the conversation, my take home is that uh, we need to train our comrades to be job creators. And actually, that's what we've been doing. But now the conversation ends there at uh, training our comrades to be job creators. They ask you now, what next? After training us to be job creators, what next? So in your space, what can you do, especially in this region? I've not seen any business incubation center so that we can nurture. If you ask these comrades here, everyone has a business idea. How do we nurture these business ideas? In your space as an MP and as in that space, national space, how can you help us in this region to nurture these business ideas to become big, big business people? Yeah, that is what I wanted to ask you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. And I think uh, Professor Ochona can take up that. There is no better host to host an incubation center than Tombo University. So I also throw the ball back to your court. But where we need to act in terms of resources, we see what to do. And you know what happens, what do you hear about Silicon Valley? What do you hear about Silicon Valley? The tech companies you hear about. It is also a convergence of deliberate policies. There was a policy in the US called STEM for promotion of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Then, around the same area, there is Stanford University. But then, for that cycle to complete, there has to be a Wall Street. There has to be finances. And finances, especially in startups, never come from banks. They come from venture capital, and they come from private equity. Because the only asset you'll have is an idea. And I am sure there is a lot we are doing in that regard as government, only that Rome was not built in a day. And so that I uh, get out of here, I want to thank you very much, everyone. I, it was my great honor to be here at Tomboy University today. And I think next time, I'll not come during a parliamentary day. So that we go to the mess, we eat, and we take much more time in this 
in this beautiful institution. I have really enjoyed. And when you get time, I want you to read a speech. Two speeches. One which was given by Patrick Henry, called Give Me Liberty. And especially political scientists will find it at, um, engaging. Give me liberty or give me death. As a young person, you have to have the agility and the firmness and the drive to want what you want at any cost. Read about, read that speech literally. There is another speech I want you to read. A speech given by the Reverend Jesse Jackson when he was vying for the primaries in the US, I think in 1988. The speech is called Keep Hope Alive. Keep Hope Alive. You go read those speeches, there is something you'll get out of it. And especially that one of Jesse Jackson, there are a few words that I used to read when I was a student leader. When he was reading the speech, he said that I was born in the slums, but the slums were not born in me. They were also not born in you either. Wherever you are today, know that you can make it. Stick your chest out and know that you can make it. And the summary of it, you must never give up. You have to be persistent, look for what you want so badly, and I am sure you'll get it. Thank you very much, and may God bless you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, our chief guests, Onalambo Didinyolo. The um, Vice Chancellor, Toboya University. The Vice Chancellor, Maseno University. The County Commissioner. Our collaborators from Robert Gordon University. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon once again. Yes. Have we learned something? Yes. Thank you very much. As we draw the curtains on what has been enlightening and thought-provoking uh, day, I stand before you to extend our heartfelt gratitude to everyone who contributed to the success of this public lecture that has been very every derivant by our esteemed Honorable Didi Nyolo. First and foremost, I want to thank our almighty God for making this day a success. God was with us in the planning, in the journeys that have been made, and really we want to thank God for that. Secondly, let me express our deepest appreciation to Honorable Didi Nyolo for gracing us with this very insightful lecture. His wealth of knowledge, coupled with his passion for youth empowerment and good governance, has undoubtedly left an indelible mark on all of us gathered here today. Your words have ignited us, uh, ignited a flame of inspiration within us, motivating us to strive for positive change in our communities. Something that has come out very clearly for Kenya to change, the mind frame of its people must change. We have taken that very seriously. I would also like to extend our sincere thanks to the organizers, led by our very able fight chancellor, all the way from the time of inviting uh, our guest speaker to the neat and gritty uh, preparations that he has ensured were done. Thank you so much, team, for your meticulous planning and execution of this event. Special recognition and the honor goes to Professor Julius Nyabudi, Vice Chancellor of Maseno University, who is also our mentor and friend. Prof, when we see you, we see a parent with us, and a parent who has agreed to work with us all through. Thank you so much. And to other special guests, I also say thank you, and particularly the Robert Gordon team, led by Professor Stephen Fatigans. Thank you so much for agreeing to be with us today. 
Our gratitude further extends to our distinguished guests, the scholars, we have the scholars here, the faculty members, we from uh, Tobe University, Maseno University, and even students from Maseno University, and the greater team from Toboya University. Thank you so much for making this event very successful. To the members of the public and the entire audience who have honored us with their presence, we say thank you. Your active participation and the insightful contributions have enriched our understanding of the vital role that youth play in shaping the future of our nation. As we depart from this gathering today, let us carry with us the lessons learned and the inspiration gained from Honorable D.D. Nyolo's lecture. Let us harness the power of youth to drive transformational leadership and good governance in our society, just uh, like Thomas, Joseph, Boyer, and Vincent. Once again, Thank you to everyone who has contributed to the success of this day. Let us continue to work together towards a brighter and more prosperous future for all of us. God bless you even as you make your journeys back to your residences. And you are most welcome to Toboya University. Any other time, we love visitors. Please come and visit with us any other time. Thank you, thank you so much. Our guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this session. I will request that we all rise for the national anthem, the first stanza, and a closing prayer from Ebel Manas. All is good that ends well. God bless you. <laughs>